Welcome back. Um, my name is Sabrina Kleisland. I'm an associate working with the Carbon Trust, and I'll be your host for today's last session. So we will now hear from seven companies that have received support from the base Industrial Energy Efficiency Accelerator as part of phase one and two. We will hear directly from the projects um, what they have been up to over the past two years or so, demonstrating their innovative technologies under real world circumstances. So our first case study of today is by Rice and Renthia, um, working together with D.S. Smith on energy efficient dewatering for the paper and pulp industry. Hi, this is an overview of the project Novel Dewatering Solutions within Corrugated Case Medium Manufacture. The project was undertaken by a partnership of RISE Research Institutes of Sweden and DS Smith. Over the next few minutes, you're going to hear from myself, Michael Sturgis. I was the project manager for the project and I work for RISE. You're also going to hear from Ignazio de San Pio. Ignazio was the technical lead for the project um, based in Stockholm for RISE. And you're also going to hear from Guy Lacey. Guy was the, uh, the lead for the industrial partner, DS Smith. The technology that we're going to introduce to you was first piloted at RISE's uh, pilot paper machine uh, and laboratories in Stockholm in Sweden. This was an important um, proof stage before transferring the technology and demonstrating its potential at DS Smith's site, uh, the Kemsley Mill site in Kent in the UK. And here you see a picture of the Kemsley Mill uh, to give you a feel for the scale of the operation. The need was really about trying to reduce energy consumption during the drying stage of the paper making process. Um, the drying section is responsible for 75% of the paper machine's total energy consumption. And increasing the dryness of the paper, uh, of the paper web by 1% after the pressing section can reduce the steam consumption by 4%. So you can see very, very large potential energy savings to be had. We were confident that the technologies and processes that we had developed um, could be implemented at a paper mill and achieve some of those savings. The difficulty is, of course, introducing new unproven technologies in a mill environment is incredibly risky. Um, so the funding from the demonstration project was needed to help de-risk some of that uh, um, uh, implementation phase. So that was the need. I'm now going to hand over to Ignacio, who's going to talk about the technology. Thank you, Michael. So when we want to reduce the drying energy, we need to improve how the paper is dewatered during the formation of the sheet. This formation of the sheet, this dewatering is very linked with the size of the particles and the efficiency of the chemicals used to get the right paper properties. In that sense, the technology that was developed was the application, the demonstration of a novel way to measure and control the particle size in line in the inlet of the forming section of the paper machine. So what we see on the center is that probe that was developed for other sectors. And now we are showing the application that can have to control and optimize the wet end section on this paper machine. On the right side, the graph we see is precisely this demonstration, this correlation that exists between the chemicals used in the process, the value obtained from the probe and the, in that case, the vacuum and the energy needed for the, to the water. Considering this technology that was developed and combining it with a full process optimization, understanding where were we losing a bit this efficiency, we 
managed to identify a saving potential of up to 10% of this energy. We are speaking about saving up to 19,000 tons of CO2 per year. In order to get to this result to these savings, the need of investment is reduced, delivering an annual saving of up to 877,000 pounds per year, and that gives a very good payback. On the right side, we can see how was the impact for different products on the steam consumption, which will be the main driver on the energy consumption. In addition to that, by controlling the process efficiency, by controlling the chemistry, we will get process stability as other benefits and also opening the door to improve product performance. So Guy, maybe you want to comment a bit your perspective? Thank you, Ignacio. Yeah, so from an industrial partner, the key thing we saw working with RISE and with Carbon Trust and Jacobs was we were able to access the expertise that RISE had, but most importantly, this innovative crossover technology uh, of the FBRM, the probe that you just saw. And using that, we were able to see in real time something we'd never seen before. And by doing that, we could understand our way, our process in a way we'd never before envisaged. And I think looking back, our industry, I guess like most industries, is very specialized. Our supplier base have been with us for many, many years. It's a very narrow supply base in some respects, certainly when it comes to paper making technology. So being able to use technology, uh, novel technology from outside our, biz our business, outside our knowledge, but also couple that to the ability to look at that technology in a lab scale, on a pilot scale, and then into our industrial scale, was a huge tangible benefit for us. And it reduced the overall risk of the technology demonstration. And I think actually to summarize, the impact was so huge, we weren't actually able to exploit all of it. It was so impactful, it moved the operating window of our process into a completely new range. So we were able to see the full potential, but we weren't, be able, weren't able to exploit it fully. And there were other challenges we saw because we moved so far away from our current operating window. So yes, it was frustrating to not be able to fully employ the learnings immediately, but certainly we've seen the opportunities there with energy savings uh, that we previously hadn't considered because we didn't have this technology employed. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. So in terms of the next steps with this technology and these processes, so DS Smith will obviously be working to try to realise some of the potential savings through further development and application of the innovations demonstrated in this project, both within the, their Kemsley Mill and also within some of their uh, mills within the wider business. Now, the UK corrugated case production sector is the largest pulp and paper sector in the UK, representing 1.8 and 1.9 million tonnes per year. And it's energy intensive, you know, 1 to 1 1.2 megawatt hours per tonne of production. So this work's demonstrated that there is potential to achieve significant savings in energy consumption in the sector and associated with that significant carbon savings. Of course, every mill is different. Every mill has different operating parameters, but the techniques and approaches applied are transferable to any recycled paper mill. Thank you very much. We'd just like to say Thank you uh, and um, our appreciation to Bayes for funding this project through the IEEA Accelerator Program. And also thank you to the Carbon Trust and to Jacobs for their support throughout the project. Great, thank you, Michael and team for this. And now um, next one is Matrix Molding Systems in partnership with Barclay Plastics. So Andrew Miles will introduce um, their ultrasonic technology that enhances the flow of polymer during injection molding. Hello, I'm Andy Watts. I'm the commercial manager for Matrix Moulding Systems. We are a commercialisation spin-out from the Technology Research Centre 
who have a broad experience in R&D, especially in the manufacturing, processing and recycling of plastics. Hi, my name is Stephen Smith and I'm the Operations Manager at Barclay Plastics Limited. We are a family run business that was established in 1965. Our facility is over 85,000 square feet with 40 injection mould machines. We are the leading supplier in injection mould tooling, moulding work and assembly work. We currently supply the automotive, electrical, construction and retail sectors. And the need for the project was to, or is, to reduce uh, the energy use and carbon footprint in a very energy intensive injection moulding industry and to do this while maintaining or even improving the competitiveness of UK moulders against low cost economies. So and we've, what we've done is we've produced a new flow enhancement technology that's applicable to cold and hot runner injection moulding in order to save energy and increase their productivity. We've done this by uh, introducing a temporary reduction in the molten polymer viscosity and that's been done by um, exposing uh, the melt flow to ultrasonics. Uh, there's a simple schematic there on the screen just showing uh, the system and also on the right we have two spiral moulded parts. They're moulded using exactly the same process and parameters except that the first one has been moulded without any ultrasonic enhancement and the second one moulded with. Um, so hopefully that's a very visual um, explanation or illustration of the technology. But what this allows us to do is to reduce the temperature of the melt, um, which would otherwise make the polymer too viscous or too thick to successfully mould uh, into parts. So the impact of what we've developed in terms of energy, carbon and cost reduction is that we've been able to demonstrate a a reduction in the melt temperature of a polymer by up to 60 degrees C. This gives us a, a reduction in the energy required per moulded part of up to 34% and that's from less energy required for heating and cooling. And this also then gives us a reduction in cycle time. Uh, we've seen a reduction of up to 27% which then gives you the uh, the opportunity to increase your productivity on the machine. The system's retrofitable onto existing moulding machines so as, to so as to avoid costly capital expenditure by our cu customers. And it makes parts easier to mould. So it's the opportunity to reduce the wall th thickness to, for the lightweighting agenda and general reduction in plastics use. And also the opportunity to increase the recycled con content um, in existing parts which would otherwise normally, again, increase the viscosity of, of the polymer. And also to mould existing parts again, but on smaller, more energy efficient uh, mach machines. The project has provided Parker Plastics with the opportunities to benefit internally from the energy, carbon and cost reductions that were listed in the previous slide. Also using our involvement in the project to help support Sony Plast development, which has helped us to market microplastics as an innovator within the injection molding in industry. The Sony Pass project has further increased our in-house tool manufacturing capability and provided us with the opportunity to provide Sony Plus ready tools for other injection molders. So beyond the IWA project, the Sony Plus product is at market entry and it's being trialled at, uh, at, at a few potential large UK customers. They've also been successful in securing IETF development, uh, uh, deployment rather, fun funding in order to facilitate the rapid rollout uh, of the technology at their large UK sites. Um, the technology is now potentially applicable in the production of any thin plastic part, which, which means around about eight millimetres uh, and below. And the learnings that we've gained from this project has now been used to further refine the technology in new R&D projects like the Energy Entrepreneurs Fund, uh, which is just um, in its early state stages. And Matrix Moulding and Barclay are going to continue to work together both for the commercialisation now and also in, in this further development work. Thank, Thank you. you.
So we will hear now from the University of Hull um, that they have formed a project team together with EPS and NPS Humber, demonstrating an innovative evaporative dew point cooler with highly enhanced coefficient of performance for data centers. Hello everyone, my name is Cheng Zheng from the University of Hull. Uh, we have a very excited project to share with you. Um, it is a cooling project for data centers. The title is a super performance dew point cooler for data center. Uh, we, University of Hull, we have been working with a number of partners, including the environmental process systems uh, and NPS Humber LTD. We together, we in the last few years, we have been uh, developing a special uh, dew point cooler for data centers to remove the large amount of heat and save loads of energy for the end user. And this project we have designed and constructed, installed, and also demonstrated this specific technology at the uh, Hull City Center in Yorkshire. It's called Maritime City Center. As you can see from the right hand side, we have a picture showing here where the white dash box is where the uh, is, is where the data center is. And we have developed and installed a very nice uh, dew point cooler in here. And it actually saved a lot of energy, reduced carbon emissions for the site in terms of the cooling. And in this project, we have a down site survey. I did design the, the demonstrator, the, the, the dew point coolers. We built it and we installed it right here. And we have done long time uh, monitoring. And this slide shows how it works and what happens in the future. If we go to the technology itself, it's actually pretty simple, but that's the beauty of this technology. It has used a specific heat exchanger on the left hand side. We designed the heat exchanger to extract the heat, but also to retain the moisture level as almost the same as you have for the indoor environment. So you can reduce the temperature, but also keep the moisture level almost the same. We don't add moisture into it, but we reduce it by water evaporation. The right hand side, we made a simplified animation. Uh, we have servers on the left producing heat. You want that heat to be absorbed by our cooler. So the hot air returns to the cooler. It cools down inside of the heat exchanger while the water evaporates. Part of the humidified air and warm air exhaust into the ambient and part of the product air and the cooled air we supply back into the room. That's how the technology works. We have been developing this technology since 2020, early 2020. And we have run the monitoring from August to September. And the energy performance is very exciting. Before the project starts, you can see from the graph here, we have the average power used for the cooling in terms of kilowatt is around 30 to 40, 35. But once we use our technology, we turned our dew point cooler on and the existing, existing cooler just drops off. The energy consumption drops off from 35 kilowatts to less than 10. And actually our dew point cooler is only consuming about two kilowatts of energy. And the rest of the blue area is the existing air conditioning running on standby. So by comparing, and this data is the monetary data, is the real life data we gathered from the site at the Hall City Center. So the, the, the difference is significant and and we actually saved about 90 percent of the energy and carbon emissions and that if you calculate in the annual carbon emission savings it's it's over 70 times uh, equivalent of of co2 emissions and uh, that's a lot of uh, money as well in terms of the electricity bill reduction not to mention the electricity price will go up in the next few years and this technology actually helps the client to save money and also reduce carbon emissions. We have been working with a number of um, technology de developer and technology uptaker. Uh, 
And one of our partners is really excited in this technology, haven't been promoting the sustainable energy technology for over 25 years, he said, Mr. Zafa. And they are thrilled to see the demonstration work today. We actually proved that the, tem the, the technology works and we will continue to develop, develop this technology together with a number of clients and OEM clients as well. And we also, in the, this month, in November, I have seen the technology uh, broadcast and, and uh, marketing in, in, in a number of uh, news and uh, city councils are willing to use the, the, this technology in the future. So what happens after the base IAEA program? Um, the first thing first is the, is the demonstration is still running at this moment. At the, at, at the data center and the clients at data center is more than willing to keep using the, the technology so we will get more data and have more impact from the from the project um, and also in terms of the technology itself uh, the university the partners will be continuously working together to improve the technology especially for the reliability longer terms and also marketing and make the technology ready for the commercialization. A lot of things can be done in the future. And these things will be based on the learnings and the experience from the project. Um, this kind of technology, the dewpoint cooler, can be used to a lot of uh, buildings and spaces that require cooling and ventilation, including data centers. You have servers producing heat or railway stations. You have machinery or uh, indoor heat source and so as well as greenhouse you have the horticulture sector where the 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 greenhouses will gather the sun and cre create internal heat source and you want to maintain the moisture level or co2 within the greenhouse that's a good way of of doing it by using our dual point cooler ventilation uh, and also that can be made to industrial buildings uh, in the past few years university of Hull, we have done a test in the industry buildings and the uh, result is very promising. Lots of uh, spaces can be done, uh, can be cooled with the new technology and university and the partners will be working together to make the research with impact. Thank you, for, thank you very much and hope this will uh, generate more collaborations in the future. Thank you. Um, next is LAT Water. So they have demonstrated their wastewater treatment and separation technology at one of Viridor sites. So LAT's technology is operating um, using low grade waste heat with zero emissions to air or water. Hi, I'm Mark Hardiman, the co-founder and chief executive of Lat Water. We've developed an innovative way for treating heavily contaminated industrial wastewater using low-grade heat uh, or renewables to reduce the energy and importantly the cost for the operator for handling the contaminated water. Our partner we've been working with is Viridor Waste Management the uh, leading UK waste company, which many of you have seen collecting rubbish from your doorsteps. Uh, we are handling uh, the waste at a landfill site uh, in the West Country near Exeter in Devon at a place called Broadpath Landfill Site. Uh, next slide, please. The technology works by thermally heat, using the low grade heat to heat warm the dirty water where it is partially evaporated and transferred into a second uh, steel column where we condense it, recover the, the heat on the condensation and recycle the energy back into the process. We end up with very clean water with almost zero contaminants 
and importantly as part of a process with using the waste heat which was otherwise go up the chimney into the environment we're using a heat from a biogas generator we reduce the amount of heat going directly into the air so global warming comes down as well as the impact on energy reduction with no uh, contact to the atmosphere in our reactor vessels, the columns, uh, we make sure there are no contaminants going into the air and also capture some methane, which of course, again, makes a huge impact onto global warming. Thanks, uh, next slide, please. The results, we've had six months run runs with the site, uh, achieving uh, between 75 to 80% water, clean water recovery and a peak of nearly 91%. A total energy impact of looking at the whole process uh, shows that we've reduced energy in the leachate treatment by around 70% compared to the legacy uh, processes. This is made up of a reduction of about 45 percentage points in transport costs and 25% in reduction in the energy used in the direct processing. All of this translates to Viridor getting an operating cost reduction of around 48% compared to their legacy uh, processes. And the CO2 emissions uh, on our pilot plant have been uh, on an annual basis uh, calculated at around 360 tons of CO2 equivalent. That does not include the impact of using the waste heat and reducing that discharges incidentally. If we rolled this out across the UK generally to a landfill sector, it would give the opportunity to make up to 300,000 tonnes of CO2 emission reductions per annum. Thanks. Next chat, please. From Viridor's perspective, uh, they're really excited by this with delivering an uptime of over 90%, no harmful discharges to affect their permitting and excellent water quality results. Uh, have resulted in us being able to look at a commercial rollout in 2022. Our counterparty, we've been working with Tim Rothray, the Director of Innovation, who unfortunately cannot be here today, has really been tremendously supportive. But as he says in the quotes on the right, uh, reducing the costs of 50% in handling the leachate, which is the biggest single cost in landfill operation, is a major attraction for them as well as helping the circular economy as we have ideas of mining that concentrate for other minerals. Uh, he also commented earlier this week that it's helped us move from a, a technology which may be applicable through the valley of death, which many of us have experienced in new technologies, to actually full commercialization. So we're very grateful for the support of uh, Bayes and the IEA program in doing this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, moving on, 2022, we are looking to roll this out across other landfill sites in the UK, of which there are actually about 3,000. So it's a big market to tap into and reduce energy costs and emissions and handling the leachate from these sites. We're in active engagement with most of the main operators who are all excited by the prospect, and we're in the process of testing their waters in our laboratory in Berkshire. Beyond that, we are looking to roll out into other areas, food and drink, chemicals, power generation, really excitingly, aquaculture, where we're engaging with leading aquaculture project for growing uh, fish in the UK. Beyond that, recovery, I mentioned, of a minerals from a concentrate. And in the time we've been working with the IEA, it's been instrumental in helping win three export orders. And the beautiful picture on the right is our site in central China, which we are just commissioning. Uh, it was taken last month, and that will be operational at the end of this month. So we are really grateful for the support that's been given and has enabled us to bring us to full commercialization. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mark, and really exciting to hear about all these rollout plans coming soon. Um, moving on, so now we will hear from Tony Miles at Agritech Systems, um, our first IEA project to have finished earlier this year. Um, Tony will talk about Agritech's energy efficient processing of animal byproduct, um, which simultaneously separates it into solids heavy, 
heavy liquid and light liquid at low temperature. Hello, my name is Tony Miles and I work for Agritech Systems Limited. We have been working with the Carbon Trust, revolutionising the food waste and animal byproducts industry. With Carbon Trust, we have installed a revolutionary ASL plant into a fall and stop facility. One of the huge advantages of our facility is that it is less than eight metres by four metres wide and can process up to 10 tonnes an hour. Following is a video animation of the process. Welcome to Agritech Systems Limited, creators of innovative technology designed to help companies reduce wastage, maximize the circular economy, and create a profit opportunity. Just like our patented AMET process. AMET stands for Agritech's Mechanical Extraction Technology, which is a process that separates animal byproducts into three valuable products. So, how can we help your business? One of the areas that we specialize in is fallen stock processing. Right now, there's a cost and environmental impact of using third parties to provide a rendering service and an increased risk of disease from having fallen stock on site and moving it about the countryside. With our patented AMET system on site, we can solve all of those issues. Simply feed your material into Agritech's mechanical extraction technology process and AMET does the rest, separating the reusable waste efficiently into three key components. Oil, which can be used on site as a biofuel for heat and electricity, creating energy security or sold on to various industries. Protein, which can be used as a fuel in cement kilns. And effluent water, which will need to be treated according to local regulations. So if you want to cut the chances of diseases spreading, cut the costs of using third parties, transform your fallen animal stock into revenue and transform your circular economics. Find out more about AMET from Agritech Systems Limited today. Visit agritech.co.uk. The three main outputs from the process are oil, protein meal and effluent water. The oil is the most valuable and sought after by many industries, including the soap industry and pet food industry. However, of late, biofuel has become a major demand in this area. It can also be used on site to create heat and electricity and energy security. Secondly, protein meal. This is certainly sought after by various industries, pet food and animal feed industries. The reason for this being the traceability and the provenance of the material. However, it can also be used as a biomass in the cement industry with its high protein count. Lastly, is the effluent water. This can be used to turbo dodge an anaerobic digestion plant, or it can simply go straight to drain. This has enabled our partner in this process to take full control of what was a downstream animal byproduct. They've been able to use the oil produced to generate electricity and heat using their own CHP plant to power the process, with the excess power they generated being sold off to the grid. Essentially, with the installation of the Agritech system, it's taken a site cost for disposing of the ABP into a very attractive revenue generator for them. So the summary of the data in this case study shows a reduction of the energy requirement. The thermal energy input required was down by 78% with the electrical energy requirement down by 68%. Strong numbers. So what next? Given the success of the installation, this will allow us to use the unit to demonstrate the technology in full flow to different sectors, such as fish and poultry. Once all the results are validated, this will also allow us to approach CSR teams of major supermarkets and quick service restaurants, with a view to encouraging their supply base to take advantage and install an agritech system. We will begin to facilitate the trading of oil and protein to maximize environmental benefits, e.g. biodiesel, pet foods, and to reinforce the installation payback. Thank you.
For this next bit, I am joined by Peter Hammond from CCM Technologies, who will provide the intro to his company's project. Peter, the floor is yours. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Peter Hammond, Chief Technology Officer at CCM. Our project with the IEA has seen the development and installation of a fertilizer production plant that uses recovered, recovered nutrient materials at a wastewater treatment facility. The demonstration is at Seven Trent Waters Minworth Works. That's the largest, that's the third largest water treatment site in the UK. As a result of COVID and the challenges of innovation, the project suffered some delays, but we have now installed the plant at Seven Trent Water and we're working to optimize the facility. Once this is done, we'll be completing installation of on-site CO2, heat and ammonia recovery systems designed as an integral part of the process to maximize the resource recovery and CO2 emissions reduction potential of the whole process. Throughout the demonstration, we're carrying out detailed measurement and verification of the results, and we'll publish these when we complete. Now to show you how the technology works and the benefits that it brings to the water industry, we're now going to present a short video. Thank you. Minworth is Seven Trent's largest wastewater treatment works. It treats the sewage from the city of Birmingham and the wider area. A billion litres of wastewater a day. During wastewater treatment, you produce sludge. We can take that sludge um, and digest it. It produces methane, a biogas, which we can then generate renewable energy from. We're then left with a treated sludge that's taken out to agricultural land and recycled onto farmers' fields. It's got nutrients, it's got nitrogen and phosphorus in, it's got organic carbon. However, it is wet, almost 75% water. There are also potential emerging issues. Currently, there are strict environmental limits on the amount of phosphate and ammonia that can be returned to the environment from sewage waste streams. What the CCM solution does is take CO2 that's created on this site, mix it with the organic materials, pass it through our process to produce stable fertilizer materials. So that they're producing growth in agricultural crops and no other harmful side effects. The great thing about this CCM process is that it takes the treated sludge, it can take the ammonia that we need to treat, it can take the CO2 that we're emitting from our biogas operations and we can access any spare heat that we've got to help with the drying of the process. So it's a really, really elegant fit with our wastewater treatment plant. Out of the CCM process, we get this pelletized organic fertilizer that's an analog of mineral fertilizers, but with a much, much lower carbon footprint. The CCM process saves carbon in two key ways. The first is by the direct capture of carbon dioxide from gas streams and by drawing our primary nutrients from waste materials. We can avoid having to use highly energy intensive production routes that are common in conventional fertilizer production. We're physically returning carbon back to the soil where it has a beneficial effect. We need to move away in the water industry from the traditional way we've done things. CCM is a perfect example of how that can be achieved. Here at Minworth, we've built a demonstration plant that's capable of producing up to 10,000 tonnes of fertiliser product a year. We can then look where best to roll out the technology. We've already identified four sites where we think this technology is a really good fit for us. The sewage treatment process at Minworth is very much representative of the way that sewage is treated throughout the UK and throughout the world. By demonstrating how the system can deliver the carbon reductions here, it will also show how those same carbon reductions could be delivered throughout the global sewage treatment industry.
We are coming now to the last case study of the day. Um, last but not least, you will hear from Andy Knights Cooper at Magnomatics um, describing their magnetically geared motor project. Andy, over to you. Hello, I'm Andy Knights Cooper. I'm a uh, program manager at Magnomatics in Sheffield. So I'm the lead project manager for the Cayman project. So the, the actual project itself, the original plan was to demonstrate a new uh, SRF waste shredder with Magnematics PDD technology as the motor. Uh, and that was to give a 16% reduction in energy consumption. Unfortunately, uh, our industrial partner withdrew in December 2020 uh, due to the impacts of COVID uh, and Brexit. However, Magnematics were able to ride the COVID storm, luckily, uh, and with the IWEA were flexible uh, and very helpful in uh, restructuring the project with us, um, mostly thanks to us having a very sophisticated and uh, well-respected test facility uh, here in Sheffield. So uh, the revised project now has the, the pseudo-direct drive motor, um, which is built and tested by ATB Lawn Scott, and that will be tested uh, extensively on our dynamometer facility uh, in Sheffield under an extended factory acceptance test. So the, uh, the test um, will demonstrate the predicted efficiency and the unique features of our technology, uh, hopefully leverage some interest from uh, potential users. So some pictures there of the actual motor itself, uh, exploded view and the motor on the, on the test rig itself. So the technology itself, uh, the pseudo direct drive, it's a very small high torque motor, uh, removes the gearbox. Um, it's a low speed motor, high torque. It has a high system efficiency, high reliability, low maintenance, uh, low noise, uh, reduced cooling requirements, and it can use standard power electronics. So basically the PDD integrates the magnetic gear uh, inside a permanent magnet motor. Uh, the common component um, to both the PM motor and the magnetic gear is the high-speed magnet rotor. So when we integrate the two, the high-speed rotor uh, does the job of providing the magnetic flux for both the motor and the gear. In the case of the PDD, the pseudo-direct drive, there is also a pole piece rotor which sits in between the outer stator and the inner magnet rotor. This is made up from a series of steel pole pieces um, which basically modulate the magnetic flux between the stator and the high-speed rotor uh, and create the gearing effect. Just show a little clip there of the, the fast rotor in the middle is the high-speed rotor, the slower rotor is the load-carrying pole piece rotor, and then we have the stator on the outside with conventional windings. Uh, so the, uh, the, the impacts of the project, the Cayman project was originally intended to couple a newly designed pseudo-direct drive motor to a, uh, a new waste shredder uh, with the aim of improving efficiency, reducing energy consumption and reducing CO2 emissions. Um, the current shredder drive, the incumbent system was calculated to have an overall efficiency of 73%, but the new magnetically geared PDD system uh, was predicted to have 93%. So quite an uplift in efficiency there of about 16%. And over five years that was uh, predicted to uh, reduce uh, a significant amount of CO2, uh, 140 uh, million kilos to be precise. So the projected benefits, um, obviously we're not having an industrial partner, the projected benefits are now going to be verified by extended dynamometer factory acceptance testing. So we're going to run a series of hot and cold tests, back EMF, no load, on load, uh, run a full efficiency map and, and then do some dynamic duty cycle and pull out testing to test the motor's uh, key facility, you know, the key uh, features. So an industrial partner perspective, uh, as, as I said earlier, our industrial partner unfortunately had to withdraw from the project in 2020. But with the help from the IWA, uh, Bayes and Jacobs, we managed to restructure and continue with a, a viable project so we could actually verify the predicted results. Uh, we are currently exploring opportunities to engage with uh, a new industrial partner or, or partners to perform on-site testing and demonstration using the, the PDD motor we've just built uh, and, and, and fat test under the re revised scope. So, so I think we've got several potential uh, inquiries in progress, which we hope to 
you know, yield a viable project in 2022. So I think beyond the IWA, um, seek a new industrial partner or um, that's using either Cayman or, or, a, or a new motor. Uh, we have a, a number of applications that we're looking at, mining conveyors, bulk material handling, uh, paper mill pre-shredders, industrial stirrers, for example. Um, we hope to, um, you know, uh, form a, an application under the IWA Phase 3 next year or the IETF, or, or commercially funded. Um, we also, in addition to the Cayman machine, we also have another machine that we have on demonstration, a much larger machine, uh, that's 500 kilowatts, 200 kilonewton meters of torque. So again, that would lend itself to an industrial drive. Uh, just some details there of the, of the Cayman specification. Okay, thank you for watching. really excited to hear directly from the first group of our, of our IA projects and as part of the event tomorrow we will hear from seven more projects. Um, we've reached the end of today's event. Um, thank you so much to everyone who has tuned in today for day one of our meeting the Net Zero Challenge event. Following today's more high-level discussions on UK industry and its decarbonization challenges and opportunities, tomorrow we will focus on what that actually means for industry and how industrial companies can accelerate the uptake of innovation into their um, undertakings and processes. We will be back tomorrow morning, 9.30 a.m., same time as today. Um, the keynote by Liv Garfield, CEO of Seven Trend Water, will kick off the day followed by a panel discussion with industry and industrial cluster representatives um, discussing how to bring innovation to industry. We will hear more about um, challenges faced by industry on their decarbonization journey, um, followed by the remaining case studies um, of the IEA phase one and two participants. And finally, we will hear more about the IEA phase three, which is currently open and welcomes applications. So make sure not to miss this. If you have missed any of the sessions today or want to rewatch um, specific parts of it, um, we are recording um, the event and we'll make it available to you after tomorrow. Um, don't forget to use the hashtag Net Zero Industry um, when engaging with the event through social media and please feel free to tag the Carbon Trust so we can see it. Once again, thank you so much for joining. I hope you enjoyed today and I look forward to welcoming you tomorrow for day two of meeting the Net Zero Challenge, bringing innovation to industry. Thank you and goodbye.